Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, Galatians chapter 3. We're going to pick it up where we left off last time, verse 18. Uh, Paul said, for if the inheritance be of the law, and by inheritance, he's referring to verse number 14. Now, let me go back to verse 14. And then uh, I'm going to remind you why we're doing this study. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Keep in mind, the blessing of Abraham is coming on the Gentiles, not through the Hebrew Roots Movement, not through Torah keeping, not through saying the proper Hebrew names, not in any keeping of the law whatsoever. It doesn't matter how many feast days you pretend to keep. It doesn't matter how many laws you pretend to keep. The truth of it is, if a man offends the law, the law in one point, and you can retranslate and regurgitate the New Testament all you want to, but it doesn't say the Torah. It says the law. That's what the Bible says. You see, this idea of they retranslate the New Testament because they don't like how it's translated. It doesn't match their doctrine. So what do they do? They retranslate it to match their doctrine. They don't say that the Greek says the law. They say that it says the Torah. And then they define the Torah as God's teaching for mankind. And then they say, wouldn't you want to learn what God wants to teach you for your life so you can be happy and you can bless God? See, that's how they do it. That's their catch. They try to get you to think that it's not law keeping, it's Torah keeping. You're being observant of the teachings of God on how to live your life. But the truth of it is, God laid down these commandments, the law, and said, if you keep these commandments, you'll live. If you don't, you'll die. It's that simple. And God never said, God never said, try to keep as many as possible. That's, that's not what he said. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations on the earth. And then he says, verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. He never said some. He never said try to keep as many as you can. Because that brings on boasting. And if, there's, if I've heard one Hebrew Roots person, I've heard all of them say, well, obviously, we want to please God more than you please God because we keep as much of the law as we can. That doesn't please God. It doesn't please God to try to do as much as you can. That's not how it works. It is impossible to please God without faith. That's Hebrews chapter 11. You already go read it. Anyway, for it the inheritance be of the law. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see, Christ is the one who kept all of the law. And so, if you try to teach or you have been convinced to believe that God will bless you if you keep as much of the law as you can, then you do a great disservice and a dishonor to the Lord Jesus Christ because he kept everything because we couldn't. And so in your attempt to honor God, you put shame and bring shame upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saying that his actual keeping of God's law doesn't mean as, as much as your partial observance of God's law. Uh, I just don't go for that. So anyway, 
For the inher- back in verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? What Then why do we have the law? Why do we have the Ten Commandments? Is it good to not commit adultery? Yes. Is it good to not lie? Yes. Is it good to not kill someone? Yeah. Is it good to not covet? Well, sure. If we could be content with what we had, we wouldn't need all the other things that our eyes look at and we'd say, boy, I'd like to have that, right? So wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The seed should come is the seed, the incorruptible seed of the Lord Jesus Christ, the new covenant, the new birth. Verse 20. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. And he's describing here the work of Jesus Christ in that he is the mediator between God and us. God who is holy, we who are not. Christ came to be in our form, in the form of the flesh, so that um, he could be the mediator between us and God himself being sinless. He could stand in the presence of God for us and for our behalf. Verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. That's the point of what I'm trying to make this morning. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Let me tell you what he's saying here. He says, um, oh, let's see here. Is the law then against the promises of God? No. In fact, let me give you an example of that. Um, If we were to go to the book of Psalms, chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. You can do this any place in the Old Testament, in any place in the law, any place in the Psalms, any place in India prophets, um, where there is a blessing promised to the one who keeps the law or to the one who uh, entirely yields himself over to God and his will. There's a promise given. The idea is that that promise is only offered to those who perfectly fulfill the requirements of God. If you disobey even on one point, you don't get any of the promises. Let me give you an example. Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Have you ever listened to what lost people have told you? Even before you got saved? Yes. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. Have you ever been a place where sinners are sinning with a lot of sin around? Yes. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Have you ever mocked God or said, I ain't following that preacher. I ain't listening to that Bible. Have you ever done that? Okay. Then you are disqualified from the blessings in Psalm 1. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. It's not me. I guarantee it's not me. I don't sit around and just think, all the holy verses of the Bible. And don't think about anything else. My goodness, I have a wife to take care of. I have children to raise. I have other things that capture my mind. All right? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That is not me, and it's not you, because we've done and violated the very things that this psalm says, blessed is that man who does this. The person who qualifies for this is Christ. So if we want to attain to the blessing of, uh, he shall bring forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. If we want to attain to that, we must attain through it, to it through Jesus Christ and by way of Jesus Christ, which means Christ already has it, He's fulfilled the obligations. Therefore, he's a recipient of the blessings. 
And if we want in on those blessings, we must be in Christ and Christ in us simultaneously. Otherwise, we get nothing but the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. What's eventually going to happen to this body? It's going to turn to dust. The wind's going to blow it all away. It's nothing. And so, uh, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Paul says in Romans 7 that essentially, and I'm paraphrasing here, but every time he violates the law, he consents that the law is good. And the whole, and the law is holy and the commandment holy. So we're not saying the law is bad. The law is great. The law is fantastic. The law is glorious. The law, Moses being the recipient of it, comes down from Mount Sinai with his face shining so bright they can't look at him. Put a veil over your face, Moses. And Paul said, if that law was glorious, so much so the children of Israel could not see Moses, they couldn't look upon him, how much more glorious the living, uh, the law of life or the law of liberty in Christ, the New Testament. So the law is great. The law is fantastic. I love the law. I can't keep the law. Christ can. Christ did. And if I'm to be the recipient of the blessings that fall on Christ, I must be in Christ and trust only in Him. I have no confidence in our flesh whatsoever. He says here the law is a schoolmaster. Now, we've forgotten what that's like in liberal America or liberal Holland or liberal Australia or liberal Canada or wherever, whatever liberal state you're from. We've forgotten what that's like. Back when our grandfathers went to school, they knew about a schoolmaster. That teacher, that schoolmaster had the right, had the blessing of the parents to whoop that child, to apply a rod to that child's backside, to inflict great shame upon a student, putting a dunce cap on their head, sitting them in front of the class to embarrass them about what they had done. The schoolmaster is a strict disciplinarian. This is why we don't have a lot of people going to heaven right now. Because they've been raised in liberal schools, raised by liberal parents who will not apply the rod of correction to them. Therefore, in their mind, their mind and all the connections and brain synapses that have been making connections in the formative years of their life, by the time they get to be a young adult, they think they can do whatever they want and get away with it with no consequences whatsoever because they've never had a schoolmaster teach them the rigid discipline that comes with rules. The schoolmaster sets down the rules. The parents set down the rules. If you violate those rules, you get a severe beating. Not out of hate, out of love. Because by the time that child is matured, you want them to know that there are consequences that come about as a result of wrong actions. And, I tell you, and it's not impossible to take someone who's been raised in a liberal fashion to bring them to the grace of Jesus Christ. But first, they must be under the conviction that they're rotten, hell-deserving sinners that deserve the very wrath of Almighty God. And I mean the fierce wrath of Almighty God. Okay, Talking about like fire and brimstone kind of wrath of Almighty God. That's what they deserve. They deserve what happened to Sodom is what they deserve. I guess this is why we don't punish Sodomites anymore. Because it's the mindset of people that no one ever gets punished and should ever get punished for whatever their cravings or appetites are. Okay? But anyway, the main premise of this is, is that God hath, con this is verse 22, the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. It is about believe and not about the works of the law or the attempted works of the law or whatever. There is an assumption made by the New Testament that everybody then is a wretched sinner and no one's different. But we have a lot of people who think that they're different. They think that they can violate the will of God, the law of God, without any consequences and that really they're not a bad person. 
Let me read this scripture to you to let you know what kind of bad person you really are. Let's start in Romans 1. Let's go down the list here of 23 things. 23 is the number for death. Okay? There's 23 things here that he that commits such things is worthy of death. Let's read them and see if there's anything in this list that you might be guilty of. Number 1. Romans 1, 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. That covers everything. Unrighteousness. Anything that's not right. Number two, fornication. Whether it's in body or mind. Fornication. Fornication is any, any kind of unclean conduct outside of the marital relationship. Okay? I'm not going to say more than that. You know what it, you know what it is. Number three, wickedness, right? Covetousness. Covetousness is part of American advertising. American advertising, whether it's print ads, radio ads, or TV ads, is trying to entice and elicit a covetous response out of us by us saying. I want that hamburger, okay? Or I want, I want that beer. I want those cigarettes. They banned, the United States government banned cigarette advertising on television because they knew how effective it was to convince people that that's it, that's life, okay? And yet here's the Marlboro man 30 years later with a big hole in his throat Having to have oxygen pumped into him 24 hours a day, having to talk like this, do that little thing. Okay? That's why they eliminated TV advertising for cigarettes because it was working way too well. Anyway, covetousness. Maliciousness. Doing things for a malicious reason. Getting back at people. Okay? Um, your neighbor's child looked mean at your child. So you went out in the middle of the night and dumped their trash all over and blamed it on the dog. That's maliciousness. Full of envy. Wanting to be like everybody else. Uh, murder. Debate. you always arguing with everybody. And I know people like that. No matter what you say, they're going to argue with you. Deceit. You'll deceive people, lie to people, put up a false front, make everybody think you're, you're righteous, that you're holy. You Jewish roots people, you're not fooling me. You uh, quote-unquote Sabbath keepers, you don't fool me. Okay? I, I called a guy on it. A guy called me and wanted to know how come I didn't keep the Sabbath. And I said, how do you know what I did on Saturday? Well, you didn't go to church. Okay, well, let's see. While you were at church, you were looking at some woman there. Well, I'll tell you, and it's what he said. He said, I haven't done that in years. God delivered me from that. I have not looked at another woman in years. And I'm going, you might have told your wife that, but that's not true. You're sitting there lying through your teeth to me if you tell me that you haven't lusted after another woman in the last 10 years. Lying through your teeth. That's deceitfulness. Malignity. Whisperers. You know what that is, don't you? Did you see what, did you see what, he, did you see what she had on? Did you see what she was wearing? Gossipers. Backbiters. Haters of God. Despite, by the way, when you hate... The grace of God, you hate God. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers. You, you don't keep promises. You don't keep your word. Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. 23 things here. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So, whether you're actually committing the fornication, or you're just watching it on the internet, or in a movie at the theater, it doesn't matter. Because you either do these things, or you have pleasure in the people that do these things. You laugh at the dirty jokes. And you laugh watching the sitcoms that are telling the dirty jokes. Okay? I, I'm, in my younger year, I'll be honest, I used to think those things were funny. 
Dirty jokes? Oh, yeah, that's, that's hilarious. Oh, yeah. When I was, uh, I remember when I was a boy, like 10 or 11 years old, to be around adults that were cussing, that would just crack me up. I would laugh at adults that were cussing or even older kids that would cuss. And use, I thought that was so cool. And laugh? It's in my nature, okay? Uh, let's move on. Anyway, these th- if, you, if any one of these things you have already done, then you're guilty of the law. God has concluded you under sin. He's put you under sin. You were not born without sin. You've got it in you, and it has been manifested in your life. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. And that's what we do. We like to pick one of these things here that somebody else is doing and just rail on them because they did those things. Bless God, I didn't do that. No, but you were a, uh, let's see, you weren't a whisperer, but you are full of deceit. You're a debater. You're full of envy. You're malicious. You're covetousness. You're full of covetousness. You're implacable. You're unmerciful. You don't, you're, you're bashing people who did, let's see, who, who were backbiters and yet you were unmerciful. You weren't going to forgive them. So thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And it doesn't matter who you are or what your last name is, whether it's Hoggard or Epstein. Epstein, either way. doesn't matter if you're Greek, Gentile, or Jewish. Okay? You are, God's judgment is going to be against those who commit those things. Not somebody who does something that you think is worse than what you did. Everybody gets the same judgment. Everybody does. Verse 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? What? Just because you never murdered anybody and yet just about every woman you look at, you lust after. And I knew a man that he was very boastful about his lust. He was at a church I was at a long time ago and the pastor just sort of had him kind of working with the young people, the teenagers and the kids. And I used to like him because we had the same computer back then. This was back in the 80s. And I used to go over to his house all the time and stuff like that. And then I'd listen to him talk. And we went out one time to pick up some things for a party for the church. And he was like looking at gals walking down the street going, man, did you see her? And I'm going, well, yeah, I saw her. I'm not married. You are. And you know what he told me? Well, it's okay to window shop as long as I buy at home. And you know what? I heard that and I'm going, that ain't right. And I guarantee you, I don't know how that man's marriage ended up. But I always felt sorry for his wife, for his kids. Because I thought, man, this thing's going to come loose one of these days. Because I promise you, you window shop enough, you can quit buying at home. Okay? Anyway, so that's what he's saying here. Do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God just because you didn't murder somebody but you lust after people, lust after things? Romans chapter 2, verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. It's not enough to just go to the Torah teaching. You got to do everything that the law says. And if you had this, and if you went to the Passover Seder feast that's modeled after the Jewish tradition, you did not keep the Passover. Oh, you may have heard these great teachings. They were not from the Bible, number one. And number two, that doesn't count. You have to keep the whole law. And nobody does. Verse 4. 
For when the Gen- excuse me, verse 14, Romans 2, 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Look at verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? This is something God dealt with me about a long time ago. Mike, if you're going to preach on sin, preach on yours. If you're going to preach on sin, preach on yours. Make it fair. Don't just preach down to everybody else and skip over the things you do. Because then you are a hypocrite. But if I teach and preach against the things that I'm guilty of, I'm not saying that I'm right in doing what I'm guilty of. I'm saying at least then I'm showing fairness in saying, now I'm not going to tell everybody from the pulpit everything I do. That's not your business. Your, your doings are not my business. They belong to God, and that's where they stay. But I have to preach on them. I can't just excuse myself while I go after everybody else. It's not how it works. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? You know what the biggest, you know what the biggest Bible worship, or Bible worship, kind of giving myself away here. Do you know what the biggest idol worship is amongst fundamentalists? King James only ideology whereby we boast that we have the Bible. And we boast about it to everybody else in the world. Meanwhile, we're doing everything that this Bible says is wrong. Or not doing what this Bible commands us to do. That's just like Israel grabbing the Ark of the Covenant, going out to war against the Philistines. Okay? They lost that battle and they lost the Ark of the Covenant as a result of it. They were using the Ark of the Covenant as a little talisman or an idol or a good luck charm or they were tempting God with it. And it's almost like people tempt God with their doctrine and their stand on issues as if because I believe and because I have a certain stand on certain moral or religious issues that that grants me a free pass to go do whatever I want. Mm -mm. that's sacrilege you're an idol worshiper of a different kind you're upholding the King James Bible as like because I believe the King James Bible then that excuses me from everything else and it's sacrilegious you're a hypocrite is what you are Um, verse 23 thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law dishonorest thou God For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So because you kept Passover and yet, let's see here. You, You went to a Passover Seder, but then you went home and uh, illegally downloaded a movie off the internet. Well, that's stealing. You don't own it. You didn't buy it. You didn't pay for it legally. You Ill- illegally downloaded it. You stole somebody else's property without their permission. You can call it whatever you want to. You can justify it by saying, well, they make enough money. Who cares? It's their property. Whether they make another dollar off of you or not, it's still their property. So... You go out and you keep Passover and yet you go and break the law. Jim Staley goes out telling everybody to keep Passover and to keep all these feasts 
because he does and he makes his boast in the law and yet he is stealing money from old people. That's why he's in prison right now because he got caught. Anyway, all of his righteousness doing becomes unrighteousness at that moment. Verse 26, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if he'll fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? Verse 28, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Now, I like this, okay? Um, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. Heart has four chamber, chambers. I'm going to show you why, why that's relevant in a minute. Is Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now, the word Jew is a derivative of the word Judah. Okay? Now, don't... I'm not even going to get into this. The word Jew denotes, later on in the Bible, it denotes everyone who is of the seed of Abraham. All right? So I'm not going to get into this white supremacist argument that only Judas are from the, only Judahites are the Jews. All right? It does include everybody. But here's my point. He specifically used the word Jew being from the tribe Judah, which is the fourth tribe. Four denotes the gospel, number one. Number two, it denotes spiritual realm. Christ was not from the tribe of Levi. That was the third tribe born. He's from Judah, the fourth one. So his priesthood is a spiritual priesthood, not a physical one. Then, and that's what he says here. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. Judah, fourth tribe, heart has four chambers. In the spirit. And that's what the number four designates as a spiritual realm circumcision. Peeling off the outer flesh, freeing the spirit, which is that part that is to be saved in us. Romans 3. Now I'm going to, let's see here. I got a long way to go here before I get done with this. We're basically looking at this idea that God has concluded all under sin. Romans 3, 5. But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall... Or, let me read that again. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? So, when we... And this is what Paul was saying in Romans 7. When we break the law, we consent that the law is good and that the law is holy. So our unrighteousness and the fact that when we do things wrong, we know it and we feel guilty about it, about it, we are saying, yes, God's law is holy and God is holy. And since God, Jesus Christ, did not ever break the law, He is the one who is worthy to judge the world. Those who have sinned cannot rightly judge the world because we sinned along with the world. We're also... A, an accused felon in a courtroom cannot be both the judge and the accused. Now, there are judges who are accused. There was a judge over here in Illinois a few years ago got caught dealing in drugs and taking large amounts of drugs. And then they started looking at his case log found out that he was letting drug dealers go because then he would use them afterwards to get drugs. And that was the deal. I let you go in court, then you supply me with all the drugs I want. And that's how it's going to work. They finally caught up with him because one of the other judges that was in on it died in a cabin that they had from a drug overdose. And the police are investigating. They found out this judge was dirty. So immediately, he's taken off of the bench. He's not a judge anymore. Why? Because he's the accused. The only one who is worthy and capable of being the judge is Christ because he cannot be accused. He didn't do anything wrong. So you understand that. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Zero. Not you, not me, not the Pope, not 
all the famous evangelists in the world, not all the TV preachers who make it look like they're wealthy because they do all the right things with God. It's a lie. They're wealthy because people out there were stupid enough to send them their money. That's why they're wealthy. But anyway, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are uh, together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. You see, God just has a funny way of proving things. Your throat is an open sepulcher. Smell your breath. Or have somebody smell your breath right now. Okay? Ask them, does that smell like dead things to you? Oh, yes. Oh. You're full of dead things in you. Paul said it, in my flesh there is no good thing. Anything that proceeds out of man... I don't care from what hole or pore it comes from. And I'm not trying to be disgusting. I'm just telling you, anything that comes out of man is disgusting and it stinks. Everything does. We're just full of corruption. Our, while our body's alive, it's fighting off the corruption as best as it can. But at some point, corruption just takes over. Okay? Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues. They have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Isn't that true? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever saith the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And here it is, folks. And here's one of the reasons why you will not hear guilt and sin, specific sins mentioned behind a lot of pulpits anymore. It's because they are replacing the gospel with a different one. The real gospel, in order for it to work, you have got to become guilty before Almighty God. And a gospel that quote unquote brings you to Christ that does not bring guilt along with it is no gospel. And that's what he's saying here. Every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. There's not going to be anybody on the judgment day when God says, anybody here not guilty? There's not going to be one that says, uh, me Lord, I didn't, I didn't do all that stuff. I didn't do any of it not going to be anybody except Christ he's the one that's going to be judging us because he's not in the pool of the guilty verse 20 therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin period God has concluded all under sin but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God now you know the context of Romans 3:23 all have God has concluded all under sin being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The Hebrew Roots people would have you believe that they have more of a justification and more of a grace with God and more of a blessing from God because they actually keep 60% more of the law than the rest of you do. 60%. That's quite an improvement. Still leaves 40% of the law undone. I'm just making those up, but you get the idea. Let me finish Romans chapter 3, and we'll be done for today. Verse 26, To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Ah, here we go. See, it's not all condemnation now. Because Christ now, who is the just one, has now the right to say of anyone they are justified of their sins before Almighty God. I have paid their price. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what? 
By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. If you want any verse, Romans, write this down, Romans 3, 28. If you know Romans 3, 23, then just kind of attach this verse to that when you're dealing with someone who's of the Hebrew root, okay? Or the Sabbath keepers, whatever law keeper, whatever sacred name they are, you just simply say, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, period. Now, if they, wanted, if they want to change law to Torah, let them go ahead and read that verse again, without the deeds of the Torah. Either way, they lose the argument because we are justified by Jesus Christ, by faith, without the deeds of the law. And anything that I do that's right, I do because I love God. God, not because I'm wanting extra favor out of him. And I think that if I do more things that please God, then God's going to return back to me more things. No. I'm telling you, straight out of my heart, God is my witness. I deserve absolutely none of the blessings and the benefits that God has given me in the last few years. I don't deserve any of them. I deserve to be in hell. I deserve to be cut down before men. I deserve the entire wrath of God's kingdom poured out on me and me alone. All the things that I do the teachings, the time I spend studying, the time I spend trying to help people. I don't do those for some sort of gain with God. I've already gained far more than I could ever pay back. I do those things, number one, because I love people. And number two, I love God. And He asked me to do them, and I'm not about to tell Him no. Because of not because of what I want him to do, but because of what he's already done. Verse 29 Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Now, I'm not exactly sure I know what that means but it must be really profound, okay? I'm not sure I understand the difference between justifying people by faith and then justifying them through faith. I'm not, I'm, not earnest, I'm not sure I get it, but I'll take it either way. I trust Jesus and Him alone. I don't trust anything that I do. Even, even me sitting here giving you this Bible study, I don't trust that everything I'm telling you is 100% right, Okay? And I've, you, you'll always hear me tell you, when you get done listening to me, shut the recording off, get your Bible out, read it, and make sure what I said was right, according to the Word of God. And I'm just saying to us, let's avoid the trap of thinking that we can do things. See, even the charismatic people believe this. Because the charismatic movement loves to pull verses out of the Old Testament and say, see here, if we do these things, then God makes us rich and wealthy and healthy. Sure he does, if we do these things. But they're trying to convince you that they did them, therefore that's why they're healthy and wealthy and have all that money, have all your money. Okay? The truth of it is, those promises are conditioned upon 100% perfect obedience. And I guarantee you, Joyce Myers and Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland and all those clowns, none of them, none of them, are 100% guilt-free. Not a one of them. They have all violated the laws of God. They just don't let you know they do. They want you to think that they have those things because they 
kept God's promises or they kept God's wishes or God's laws. So they did it. That's why God owed them something. Please. God doesn't owe you anything. All right? Anyway, God has concluded us all under sin, people. That the righteousness might be of Christ and not the law. Remember, therefore we have concluded that God gives us eternal life and all of His blessings without the deeds of the law. He gives them to us by faith. And I trust God. I trust His Word. I trust everything about Him. And I don't put any confidence in my own flesh. All right? It's good to be with you. I love you. God bless you. You pray for us. Support us if you can. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.